Hi, my name is Tempest. Welcome to my temple. In this sacred space, we like to use tarot journaling and astrology to transform everyday life. And all of these things are on the menu today as I dive in and share with you some of my working with Mercury. Okay. So my stack of stuff, this is all stuff I need for this, but the basics is Mercury is about to ingress or move from Libra into Scorpio, which I'm very excited about. Um, Mercury, when it's in Libra, is actually um, an opposition for me. That means it's the opposite of where my Mercury sign is, and so it's always a time that I find very difficult. Um, so I'm here today to do like one of those kinds of wrap up videos that you'll see. People often do them the end of the month, um, like the month in their tarot practice, etc. Except I want to do these videos. At least I want to try this experiment of doing these videos for different cycles that I follow because A, it's hard to read for yourself. <laughs> reading tarot for yourself versus reading tarot for others is a vastly different thing. And so um, I found in the past and I, um, and I find with my clients, because I'm a professional tarot reader and astrologer, you can check out my website linked in the description box below. I found that I... I found that it's easier when I'm just like talking out loud. So, and I've done videos where I do readings for myself talking out loud and it, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't phase me much sharing personal things like that um, as it does for other people. And, and that's okay that it's different for them. Um, and so I wanted to... I wanted to try. This is kind of a self-experiment. So do be sure to let me know in the comments down below whether or not you enjoy this video. Um, I'm going to post a few of them, I think. But I want to try this as a self-experiment where I'm just kind of more... Like, like these are tarot and journal and astrology videos, but vlog kind of style where I'm just bringing you along with me in my life. Um and sharing through example. So today I am wrapping up and preparing for Mercury to enter Scorpio. So if you've missed it, lately in my practice I don't do a lot of traditional bullet journaling or I, I do do bullet journal style things. I still very much feel like this is my bullet journal. This is also my sacred journal and the planning and the things I do are all now aligned with my spiritual beliefs, with the astrology of the world, because that's how I like to align things. And so this year, post after my cauldron month, I've started, I, I, I created cycles for myself um, to correspond with each planet. And it kind of gives me a different nuanced look at the general themes and ideas I'm working on as I move through day-to-day -day life. Uh, Mercury has been in the sign of Libra since September 26th, Eastern time. I don't know for sure if it was the same day um, in all the time zones and is going to be moving out in... I'm filming this on the 10th. You're not going to see this. By the time you see it, Mercury will have moved into Scorpio. So, um, this is like my wrap up and I want to do this a little bit ahead so that way I can do the reflections and then do my reading. Um, so Mercury is going to be moving into Scorpio on October 13th. Again, Eastern time. I, I, I don't recall the exact time of day, so I don't know if it's in different dates based on time zones, but check that out for yourself. If you just Google it, it'll come up. Uh, Mercury is the planet of uh, that represents how you think and how you speak. So this is very um, 
much mental health wise, communication wise, those kinds of things. Here's how my Mercury pages looked for Mercury and Libra. So I always have a reflection page. I was a little out of it through the summer because I was burning, uh, not, <laughs> I was burning myself out. I accidentally started to read that, but I broke my leg. Um, so here's my reflection for Mercury and Libra in Leo. And then here's my title page. And then here's my reading. And this is where we're going to start with like reflecting. My plan for this video um, is really just the reflection. I don't know if I'm going to do the reading in person. I don't plan to. Um, I want to reflect. I can maybe at the end show you the cards I'm moving into. Um, we'll see how it all flows, but I definitely want to reflect. So I do have, I'm sorry, I'm flipping about a lot. I do have my pages all set up. I have my Mercury and Libra reflections page. I have my Mercury and Scorpio title page. The only thing missing from this is a quote. I always come back. This is how I do my setup. I do the, the loose container and then I come back and fill things in. And I did have to do a bunch of prep because I needed to see what pages I needed ahead of when the sun enters Scorpio because I I go live on Zoom with my Cosmic Coven, which is my YouTube channel membership. You can check out info of that in by clicking the join button and the description box has a link. Um, we do a live Zoom every month where we set up for the next sun season and that's this Saturday at the time I'm filming this by the again by the time you see it it will have just been it will have been this past Saturday so so I go in and I set up my my basic outline so and all of these have the same basic outline which is what I like to do I like having a basic thing I formula I follow and then the content changes, the decoration changes. That's that's how it works really well for me. So reflections page, title page, I come back, once I do the reading, I come back and I write a quote that kind of sum summarizes what I feel is the energy, the, the main point of that reading that I've just done, of that cycle, of that season. So here's Mercury and Libra. I do use three decks and quite honestly this is one of my favorite deck families um, so let me just put put my journal to the side for a minute and show you these this is my diviner definitions oracle deck it's literally an oracle deck of words let me just give it a little bit of a shuffle and I adore this. And in my in my um, cauldron month, I went through and I just kind of made everything into families. It, it, it was a whole lot. I was creating all these cycles. This is my uh, Dream Visions Tarot, my second edition. And when I, when I was building this family, my wife is the one who was like, what about the I'm here? And when I saw them, like, because this is the I'm here oracle, they shouldn't work together in my opinion. But when I saw them together, they absolutely do. I was flabbergasted. It was wonderful. So th this came very easy. Um, using the diviner definitions because when you use mercury as I said is about thinking and communication and we use words as one of our main sources of communication so I was like well let me use my words deck I now pull my word of the year in alignment with my mercury return which happens once a year versus um Versus with the calendar year, my word this year is simplify. I don't like it, but it is what it is. And um, 
So I was like, let's have a word. And then I was like, a tarot to go with it. And this Dream Visions tarot, the, the energy of it just feels very mercurial, very kind of Aquarian too, but um, like, look, sometimes the colors just line up absolutely beautifully. And the, like that, come on, passion, share the tower. Oof, it's so good. And then I, they all have a same kind of quality. Like these have the same kind of like hazy quality to the art. And I don't mean hazy in a bad way. Um, so simplicity, this is my car, my word of the year. Anyways, I adore working with these decks together so very much. Um, and so those are the decks I use. I, and the thing that comes in common, it, it's with all of my cycles in that I pull, what I do is I pull, I like to do, to do cycles in my practice where I pull cards ahead and then as the cycles go on, I look at and reflect or, or and predict on the cards and then I reflect on the previous cards. So I pulled ahead when I decided to create this deck family. I, I pulled for the whole year. I did pull in like retro retroactively for some of them, um, the Mercury cycles and that's fine. And then I pulled for the whole cycle from beginning to end from when Mercury enters Aries, because that's where, that's where my Mercury sign is. So when Mercury enters Aries, that is my Mercury return season. So once I did that, I, I pulled from Aries to Pisces. And that's a whole mercurial cycle for me. And then there's the smaller individual cycles within the larger cycle. Um, so now I need to reflect and look at what was going on for Mercury in Libra. So the cards I've had for Mercury in Libra, I put, I, I put a quote from one of them, which says no longer where you were and not yet where you're going. You are in between. And boy, howdy does that kind of sum it up because the cards I've had are liminal. Um, the four of cups and root. So these have been my cards for the season, the cycle, the season of Mercury in Libra. Mercury in Libra season. I have had the cards liminal, four of cups and root. On the liminal card here, it says three different definitions, and then there's more in the guidebook. This one says, of, relating to, or situated at a sensory threshold, barely perceptible or capable of eliciting a response. Number two, of, relating to, or being an intermediate state, phase, or condition in between transitional. Three, occupying a position at or, or on both sides of a boundary or threshold. Then we have the four of cups, and then we have root. And here on the bottom of root, it says, who are you? What's your source? What keeps you grounded? Setting some roots down can help you feel safe and present. So what I want to talk about in this video is how this has gone um, based on the cards and what I wrote in my journal and what I like thought this was going to be. And then I'm going to fill in these reflections. So those are the cards. Um, the four of cups card, the four of cups is a very, it, it's a very apathy kind of card. Um, I will not lie. I like, I know my tarot, but I'm struggling with words and thinking these days. Um, so the Four of Cups, it's it shows some regret and remorse in this card. In certain situations, you may be inclined to victimize yourself. Alternately, alternately, you may just be bored with the way your life is going right now. If you shift your focus and look for positive aspects, you will find that happiness is right around the corner and you just 
didn't look for it. Similarly, you can imply nostalgia and daydreaming. The Four of Cups is very much a card where you're just kind of out of it. You're not paying attention. In the traditional RWS, you've got um, this person is like sitting, maybe it's not in the RWS, but I can like almost see this image in my head of this person like sitting with their back against a tree and there's three cups behind them and another, a fourth cup is being handed to them. They're not paying attention to the three cups that are behind them. And they're also not, or they're focused on the three cups. Sorry, the three cups aren't behind them. They're focused on the three cups. They're focused on this emotional turmoil that they're not being, they're not seeing the fourth cup of joy being offered to them. So here we have th this, this gorgeous creature is just focused on these cups, focused on the dark, the harder emotions, not negative, not bad. Just because we don't like something doesn't mean it's bad. It has its purpose. It has its place. And the point of the Four of Cups is that you're not focusing, the, like you're, is that you're focusing too hard on the hard emotions. And that can lead to apathy. And good God, have I been feeling very apathetic. Now, if you saw my last video, um, you might have heard me mention, I got some mental health diagnoses. And I don't know yet if I want to share what my diagnoses are. Um, I can share, though, and I do feel comfortable and confident sharing that apathy is a thing I experience intermittently. It has been for years, and it is connected to my trauma and my mental health diagnoses. And... I feel like I'm on the right route looking at apathy um, because of some other cards. So, but before I get too deep into like the reality of what this has been, let me look at what I wrote. So, because this is literally what I do. So here, the quote I put was, no longer where you were and not yet where you're going, you are in between. And that was from the liminal card. And I feel like liminality really does, um, really does summarize what I have been experiencing. But as I said, before I look at the reality, let's look at what I wrote. So A, I always put a chart and I highlight where the area is. This was Mercury entering Libra. And so I looked at where Libra is on the chart. Now this chart, um, the charts that I print and put in are synastry charts. That's what they're called on astro.com. And what it is, is it's, it puts the inner circle is the chart of how the sky looks when Mercury entered Libra. And that's what tells you about this, this season, this general season. And then the outer circle is my birth chart. And looking at the relationship, the, my birth chart tells me the, play, the part Libra plays in my life. And looking at the relationship between the two is where we see um, how... This cycle of leap, this cycle of Mercury is relating to and interacting with the energy of me, the energy of my life, because this is my chart. So the astrology notes the this is the Libra. Libra in my chart is my fourth house of home roots and ancestry. In my Mercury in Libra chart, so this is dependent on time zone. If you're in EST, it would have also been a Leo rising chart for you. In, in the EST, in the Mercury ingress chart, where Mercury enters Libra, it was the third house of ideas, communication, and short distance travel. So... Looking at the two together, I wrote, is this about how I ground myself in knowledge, reading, and communication? And I wrote, how important... And I wrote about... This is kind of about how important 
how important communication, how important thinking and communication is for my body, heart, and soul. That, that hits, that hits really hard. The cards, I noted them here. And then here I put liminal, I, I, I did each card. So liminal, and here's the quote, no longer where you were, not yet where you are going, you are in between. Another quote, occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary or threshold. And I wrote that this liminal card in this was about being both and, not either or, not black or white. It's about being both and. And it's very much because liminal, it, it's that gray. And for myself, I really struggle with... I really struggle with my, I, I struggle with black and white thinking. It's not only a thing that of that impacts people who are autistic like me. Um, it's also a huge, huge thing um, contributed, like it, it's related to my mental health diagnoses. I very, and my, for myself, that's a very strong thing. I get stuck in black and white thinking all the time. I get stuck in, I have to be this or that all the time. It is rampant. And so the liminal felt like it was going to be about shifting into that. I'm not either or. It doesn't have to be either or. My thinking and my communication doesn't have to be either or. It's not about that. It's about it being both and. How can I embrace that gray, that liminality? Which also for me, my matron is fucking Hecate. My matron is a goddess of the liminal spaces. And I identify very strongly with this idea that like, while I am constantly trying to split myself and put myself into black and white categories, I am a liminal human. I am very nebulous and abstract and weird and I occupy both spaces. It's honestly a thing that has been a source of extreme confusion and identity difficulties for me because I will feel one way and then I'll feel the other way. And then it, it, it's, it's extremely confusing and very disconcerting and discombobulating. So this liminal was like, I'm trying to think of wording here. This liminal was like how to be both and, and I feel like this definitely came through in the way I'm trying to speak and trying to communicate. I'm trying to communicate as my whole self. And let's see, this started September 26th. Let me take a look. I have to do this sometimes in that I have to like reflect back and look at the calendar to see what's been going on. I think this was just around, just before. Let me find out. I'm going to skip. I'm going to edit some of this out. So for privacy reasons. Okay. So just before this transition started, I was when I was realizing, so right, right here, the 18th is when I was talking about and realizing my Pisces midheaven versus my Aries midheaven. And then a week and a day later, Mercury went into this and into Libra. And hmm. <laughs> let me see. This is the reality of my reflections. I bounce all over the place. Um, did I, I, I pretty sure I wrote retroactively when no, I didn't. I wanted to. Did I write it somewhere else? Hmm. I could have sworn I made a note somewhere of when I went into that kind of fogged feeling. Because that has happened. I've been having a time where I feel foggy. Um, which, again, goes to my, my diagnosis. When did I get my diagnosis? 
two days before. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Two days before Mercury entered Libra, I did my appointment where I got my diagnoses. And yeah, that, that would do it. Okay, so this, my diagnosis plays a lot into this because it's mental health related and Mercury is definitely, in my books, the planet of mental health. I mean, thinking and communication. That's like, come on. Anyway, um, so this, that's what I wrote about liminal. Let me ground myself back by re reading the rest. Four of Cups, I quoted, alternatively, you may just be bored with the way your life is going right now. And then I wrote, I think this is speaking to the apathy I feel, which then leads me inwards to another journey. And to that, I was referring to this inner journey. I go through, I'm a very cyclical person. And I essentially, I, I make forward momentum in my life until I come up against like a wall. And then I do an, a mental shadow work, tarot, inward journey to untangle that. So not a wall, a tangle. I come up into a tangle of energy and then I do the work to untangle that. And then I come back up and I talk about those things. And this is... I'm a constantly growing, evolving, and changing being. This is why I, I, I try to allow myself to be that, even though it throws other people off. It doesn't mean I'm unreliable. It just means I change and I grow. Um, so yeah, I was definitely feeling the apathy. And then Root, I wrote, um, quote, I quoted the, the, questions, which are, who are you? What's your source? What keeps you grounded? Setting some roots down can help you feel, um, setting some roots down can help you feel safe and present. I also quoted, what are the, what are the parts of you that have changed from the very beginning? Um, and what, I think I misquoted that. Let me check the book. By the way, I know this was a long wait. I don't know if it's still available, but I adore it. Um, what are the parts of you that have not changed from the very beginning and will not change no matter what happens? I'm going to just... I have not. And then I quote, Listen deeply and allow your inner voice to tell you who you are, what anchors you to the earth, and where your strength comes from. Um, this is also really interesting because this has come back. The whole root thing has is just a huge theme and has come back up in, in other readings. Overall, I wrote... I feel as though I am a tr tree top heavy with branches and not enough roots to pull in from to center to counterbalance it. I feel like I am a being who lives in and walks the liminal. I am the tree trunk. I need to have my roots or my roots and my branches in touch with me at all times. How would I feel about my daily life and my work with more roots put down? What ideas would I find to communicate if I took in more stimulus? It's hard to build roots that are liminal and nebulous, and yet I believe mine are, like my roots. How to be rooted and yet to be free. What roots do I need to build so I can feel and be free? What roots do I need to plant and nurture so I can grow into the tree of my whole being? And, and that last question was really kind of... That's where I felt like, aha! Um, because... In this, so th technically this isn't really prediction-y necessarily, um, and I'm hoping with these videos I'll be able to get more into the predictive territory for myself. Um, but like, I don't need to. It's okay if I don't. These, this whole time, it's like, it's like, um, my brain is blanking. Give me a sec. I feel as though this time 
in my life, as short as it's been, has been very liminal and very in between. I've been kind of processing and getting into the mindset of this new layer of understanding that I've gained through getting my mental health diagnosis. Because this, this, this thing happens that like, how can I possibly move in the direction I don't, I are moving in the direction that is on purpose and that is aligned with me if I don't feel like I know who I am. And I often don't. That is a very hard reality of my life and a very hard reality that is very intricately woven with my mental health diagnosis. I have severe identity issues. And so this period where just two days before it started, I I got a diagnosis, which to be fair, I, I knew. Um, there's something sometimes about hearing it. It was very validating and excruciatingly painful at the same time because it's like, if I... <sighs> It was validating in that way of like, yes, life is hard for you, and here's why. Um, which then triggered a lot of anger because it's like, this whole world tells me life is supposed to be easier than it is. Um, because everyone's dealing with a different set of tools, and everyone has a different brain. Um, not like literally everyone, but for me things that are it, it's it's a very common thing for any anyone of any kind of neurodivergence and and I have mul I like multiple of my diagnoses um can kind of present very similarly to like a a different neurodivergence so I'm autistic and I have PTSD I don't mind sharing that one and this other diagnosis it's like I'm things, it, it's one of those classic things, if you're at all in the neurodivergent realm, that you will hear where it's like you get a diagnosis and, or not even in neurodivergent, but chronic pain, all of these different things, you get a diagnosis and it's like, hmm, yeah, so it actually is harder for me to do that thing that everyone says is easy to do. Yep, that tracks. And there's this, there's this period for I think everyone of anger. So this whole period has been marked by that diagnosis. I'm going to, I am going to do reflecting live. I don't feel like stopping this video yet. So we're going to keep going. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to speed up and I'm going to write. Okay, so I wrote, this entire period has been marked by the signature of getting my new diagnosis, which though I knew it on some level, hearing it confirmed shapes and changes the way I view and understand myself. It also adds a layer of importance to needing to learn to walk the liminal both and life that I was talking about. Um, and for me... For me, I, I definitely think I, if y'all don't hate these videos, I definitely am going to conduct this as an experiment where I do these videos and I just share them because this really, this kind of, um, this helps facilitate my ability to be able to better do my own readings for myself, talking them out loud. Um, so when I get stuck in black and white thinking is when I feel this is when I feel this apathy because I, I end up idolizing this part of myself, this way I was as this thing that is just like unreachable. And I look at where I am now as like this thing that is somehow broken and it's not healthy. Um, it is a trauma response. Um, and so 
learning to walk this liminal life is kind of the counter to that. At least I believe so. Um, um, I just wrote, I believe learning to walk this liminal life is the counter to the apathy I feel and to me getting stuck in black and white thinking. Another thing that's funny is yesterday I got a phone call um, about um, an intensive trauma uh, a trauma -thy? an intensive trauma -thy, which is otherwise known as a trauma therapy. <laughs> I got a phone call about an intensive trauma therapy program that I was referred to when I got my diagnosis. So here we are three, like yesterday was three days from the end of this season. Here we are two days before it ends and I'm going to be starting, at least at the time of filming, I'm going to be starting um, an intensive trauma therapy program. It's an eight week long program uh, where I'm doing group therapy for two hours twice a week and also one on one therapy. Um, which, so for the record, things are going to be a bit weird. It starts the end of October and goes until mid-December. So soon things are going to be weird. I have no clue what spoons I'm going to have. So also I think doing this, um, doing this experiment for that eight uh, for that eight week period will be helpful because it will give me ease of being able to still put out content and share with y'all, which I do love to do, um, without being a bunch of pressure of trying to think while I'm knee deep in processing a bunch of trauma and doing a bunch of therapy. Cause it's going to be intense. It's going to be a lot anyway. So, so today, so, um, So let's look at it as an experiment, a, a, a self-therapy experiment. And this is also significant because um, there's, a, there's a lot of wait lists in Canada where I live uh, just for programs and help and support. And so it... I was not at all expecting it to be so fast because this is extremely fast and it does feel for me, it feels kind of divine timing kind of a thing, especially because if, if you look back here, I wrote about, where did I write? Like even just the liminal card, no longer where you were and not yet where you are going. You are in between It's a transition. I'm very much in a transition period. Um, and I hate transitions. <laughs> it's so, oh my gosh, the irony and slight irritation that my goddess is a goddess of transitions and liminal. It's, it's also like, it's beautiful and God, it's hard fucking work, which Sekete, of course it is. Anyways. Two days before this season began, I got my diagnosis, and three days before it ended. Like, that's a total of, let's see. Let's do some dates stuff. Let's look at dates. So here's where I got my diagnosis on the 26th. The one, two. Thirteen days later. <laughs> Thirteen. Thirteen days later, I got the phone call. Which, if you're at all familiar with Canada mental health care, that is like practically unheard of. I've never had a referral turnaround time be so fucking quick. And even when I got the referral and they spoke to the psychiatrist about it, they said, you'll probably get um, a call for an intake appointment pretty quickly. And then there'll probably be a bit of a wait for a program. The first thing I heard when I got the message yesterday was the next program, or like when I called back, was the next program starts on the 29th. 
of October. So like it's it's a little ridiculous. Um it's moving real fast, which is good. Um and also hard and I'm a little tired. <laughs> Very overwhelmed thinking about it. So I'm just noting that down. Another thing that came up is like this this what's your source? What keeps you grounded? And what other wording did I use? Root. What roots do I need to build so I can feel and be free? And in this, no, it wasn't in this. Where was it? So this was my, um, like reading and reflection, or this was my reading for the new moon cycle, which began October 2nd. Um, in it, roots came up, like just the idea of roots. I wrote here, um, I feel I want this process to be an active journey of heart healing, heart healing for my home roots and ancestry to branch me up to my life's purpose. Roots always comes up in Libra season for me because Libra is my fourth house of home roots and ancestry. And I wrote active heart healing to support finding and planting my roots. So then I asked myself, what heart healing do I need the most? And then I asked myself, what roots do I need to support this? I didn't even remember at the time that I wrote this that I had asked myself that question of what roots do I need to build so I can feel and be free. And then without even meaning to, without even trying, I asked myself that question and I got courage. So I'm going to write, I'm going to jot down about how I asked myself that question and how without meaning to, I got the answer and that I, I need the root of courage. Okay, so I asked myself in this reading, what roots do I need to plant and nurture so I can grow into the tree of my whole being? And without realizing, I asked myself what root I need to grow for the new moon blessing, and I got a root of courage. So I'm going to highlight this. Roots and trees in general are very important to me. I got a message years ago that I'm still kind of learning that's um, like from my ancestors that said like find me in the trees that I'm still kind of unpacking and learning what that means. Um, getting a root card for the period when I have the new moon in Libra is astounding because this is about Mercury in Libra and Libra is my home of roots. And I pulled this months ago. I pulled this so long ago that the spread where I pulled it is in this journal. I pulled these here. Um, and this is how I had it recorded. Months ago, I pulled this. Excuse me. I just very uncomfortable. And it came up again in my moon return because shot it, it's, it's Libra season, so everything's about my roots right now because that's my fourth house. So everything Libra is roots-based. And here in my Libra season, um, everything is just pointing me to this realization that what my life was before and, and who I was before is over. It's done. And... I do feel like I need this root of courage because it's fucking hard. Life is hard. Capitalism is hard. Going out into the world unmasked as your vulnerable self is hard. It takes courage. And, and for me, courage and bravery is about like being scared and doing it anyways. And it's a, 
it's a drastic shift from being rooted, air quotes, because the roots weren't stable anyways, being rooted in anxiety. Because I, I was. I was rooted in anxiety and insecurity and in an identity that was only a portion of who I am. So shifting from a root and a daily life built upon the roots, built upon the foundation of anxiety into a root of courage is powerful and terrifying. Um, I just want to write a bit about that one second. I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. I wrote my roots before were roots of fear and anxiety, which creates an unstable foundation. Um, and I'm trying to find my thought again. Sorry about the light. Um, I forgot to charge my phone while this was going on, so the flash turned off. So sorry about the lighting. Um, and I, I added, and now I'm being called to shift into a place where I am nurturing the roots of courage I already have. I've always felt like a courageous person, but I internally fight myself. And so that courageous fire I've always felt has been coming out in overpowering ways as it fights just to stay alive. Ultimately, ultimately, I do feel like a courageous person and I'm, I feel like a fiery person, but also a very watery one. Um, and my fire is like passion and my passion drives me, but it doesn't on, on, in the core on my own, it doesn't overpower me when I'm alone with my heart. Um, I'm a lot softer and a lot more intentional and more thoughtful. Um, I do get excited and I get, um, rambly and that's just excitement and joy and how it comes through me. Um, and everyone to an extent. And A thing that happens with fire, I'm an Aries sun sign and an Aries mercury, so I still have that. A thing that happens with fire is when you push it down, it will fight to get to air, so it will live the whole time. And fire can be very violent. And um, I'm not a physically violent person. I've never felt like a violent person at my core but I was trying to stifle this fire in such a way that in like, like the core of the earth, instead of my fire being this beautiful molten core, which keeps me going, which keeps me lush and nourished and, and, and keeps me turning and all of the beautiful things that like the core of the earth does and keeps me inhabitable. Um, instead of being this beautiful core, it's, it was being suffocated. And so it was flicking out, um, and causing a lot of damage. I don't know if I'm explaining this in a, in, in a good enough way, <laughs> in a way that makes sense. Um, it's a really weird process to look back on your life and wonder how the hell you got to where you are because I used to know this stuff about me and somewhere along the way it flipped and I don't know when that happened and, or I don't know how it's like, I used to say, I used to say I was a water element person. I used to identify very strongly as a water element person and everyone told me I wasn't 
because I was an Aries. And it was like, but I'm more than just an Aries. I am not either or. I'm not water or fire. I am both and. And the way that shows for me is I speak fire and passionately. Um, but I don't move like fire. I, I don't, that, that's not how it works for me. Anyway, um, I don't know when I start to talk these kinds of more ambiguous, nebulous ways, if it makes any kind of sense. Um, but it is me. Um, it's been a really great period. Um, I feel like overall, it's a bit hard to tell because I didn't do this predictions in this kind of narrative style for myself, which I'm going to do, um, cause we're going to keep going. So I'm trying to like think of wrapping this section up of the reflecting. So let's see. Ultimately, I feel like in this period, I've gained an integral piece and an integral understanding of the diagnosis I gained for me feels like my missing piece. Um, at least a, a huge one. Um, it, it kind of explains a lot. It explains a lot of the stuff that just didn't, it, it explains a lot. Um, and I feel like through gaining that I've been able, I've been put back in the, I feel like I'm, I've been put back in control of my life this year and back in control of the, like in the driver's seat, at least as, as best as anyone can be because like no one's in full control because we are not solo creatures on this earth. Um, so I feel like I've been put back in empowered in my life through this layer of understanding and it has allowed me to figure out kind of my roots even if it's hard for me to put into words I know the feeling of it um, and that's also a thing that's very true of me I struggle I love words and I struggle to put things into words in a way that I'm not sure if people understand me but I'm not even sure if I understand me half the time but I know the feeling of it I know the feeling within myself I get when I say these things and I, I live by feeling, so it kind of works. So I just wrote, I feel like I've gained an integral final piece that allows me to move forward in my life as the empowered sovereign being in control of it, finally able to build the roots I need. Now again, and I'm just moving this piece of washi over because I've decided I want to have washi on both pages here. So I'm just going to move this one. Oops. I'm going to move this one and then I'm going to add a new one so that way it continues properly from itself. Um, again, I can't overstate enough. I am under no illusions about what control I do have in my life. Um... And I don't, I don't want to control nature. Nature is gorgeous and mama, mama earth knows what she's doing. I love and trust her and revere her. Um, so I have no interest in being in control of all that. And within the realm of that, it's not that I don't have any control. It's not that we don't have any control in our life. Um, often it's that humans give up control we do have while trying to gain control that was never ours. Like, we give up control of our life 
and we try and fight for control of other people's lives because other people doing things that is different than us makes us uncomfortable. Blah, blah, blah. Not the point. Anyway, um, that's my reflections. I do want to continue because I want to, I want to see about, I, I really want to do this experiment for myself. Um, so I want to continue and see if that helps me. So if that helps me be able to facilitate this practice for myself as well. So here's my page all set up. I need to find my next cards. My next cards here, my cards. We have Trace. Justice. These are the cards I pulled ahead. And dream. Okay. The first look at all that pinkiness. See, look at this. Look at this. We've got the pink that ties in together and the brown that pulls in the, the edge of the hands and the bottom edge of the card. And now I'm gonna do my astrology notes. So Scorpio. Mercury, the planet of communication and thinking, is moving into Scorpio. In my chart, Scorpio is my fifth house of children, joy, creativity, and pleasure. Ta-da! And in this chart, in the chart of Mercury moving into it, um, for my time zone, Eastern time, it is the 10th house of life's work, career, ambition, and purpose. And I always like to just give a little highlight to those. All right. Okay, so this is this is fun because Mercury is entering Scorpio where Venus currently is. I did do a reading for Venus and Scorpio. Um, and that's going on for a little bit. Uh, so I guess that will be another reading that comes out that we'll do next or another video. Anyway, so Venus is in Scorpio. This is fascinating because it's like, um, it's like, how do I need my creativity and joy and pleasure to line up with my life's work? And, and this is very reflective of a truth of myself in that I, I am not a person at my current state where I can work just because it's a job, which does make living in capitalism extremely hard. And I've taken it, it, it's interesting because recently I was pondering to myself and I realized I've looked at things from the wrong side. And I've asked myself, I, I've looked at things and I've been like, I can monetize that, I could monetize that, people make money for this, to pretty much everything that I derive joy and creativity from. Instead of asking myself, what do I want to give to the world? What it, what are the things? What of my creativity and my joy and my passion and my pleasure do I want to share? Um, and what do I want to be just for me? Like, do I want to offer all of these readings to anyone? Not really. I want to offer very specific kinds of work and readings with people. 
and you'll see that reflected if you check out my website. I've <laughs> it's fine. I'm I'm a dedicated person. I tend to go as deep as possible with each singular thing. And I can't go as deep as possible with 20 different things. I'm a person of depth. And it's taken me lots of time of width to figure out what things I want to continue to go deep with. What things facilitate the depth I like. Um, and I've been creating things that help facilitate me diving into those depths with my clients, which is what I want to do. I want to help facilitate this kind of depth and, and, um, because it is through understanding the depths of myself that I am able to build the life that I want for myself. And I want to help people build lives for themselves that bring them joy and, and, and all of this wonderful thing. So, it's really interesting that these are coming together in this because it's like from this, I, from, from this, I think I'm going to be asking myself the question and, and, and wondering about the question of what is it that I want to give of my creativity? So asking and pondering the question, what of my creativity and passion do I want to share in my life's work that is not diminished or burdened through the sharing of it? Because I find when I share specific things, it makes me feel disempowered. Um... So what sharing, what sharing of my joy and my creativity makes me feel empowered? And it's often this kind of a thing. I, I, I love sharing my insights. I think I'm a very insightful human and I think I'm meant to share insights. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the astrology bit. Um, that I'm feeling. I'm just going to add learning about sharing. I like making people think and feel. And I like sharing my, like, epiphanies. So I feel like this is telling me this is about learning about sharing my insights through my life's work. Um, now let's look at the cards. So for the word, trace. It says here, a minute and often barely tech an often barely detectable amount or indication, a mark or line left by something that has passed to form carefully or painstakingly deline delineate, to discover signs, evidence, or remains of, to make one's way to follow a track or trail. Um, so I want to quote those and then I'll see what the book says. Okay. And for Trace... I adore, I adore this. I see, this is fun. This, this, oh gosh, this is what I love to do. And, and this is very much a, minus the journaling. This is very similar to the process I work with my clients. It's very deep and very, uh, nebulous and I love it. I'm feeling energized as I do this, which feels really good. Um, I just love diving into the depths. Um, noun, an exact duplicate, a line for line copy. If you want a close match, you can try to recreate it. It will not be the original, but it might feel like it. 
Also, sort of there, but not. You can tell it was here before. There is evidence of it existing at some point. However, now there are only fragments of it left behind. Oh, that feels potent. Um, to relive it all, or a verb, to relive it all, or at least tell the story, double back, try again. Sometimes to understand where you are, you have to recount the steps it took to get here. Adjective, an infinitesimal amount is still more than zero. Stray particles can alter an entire chemical compound. A single atom can change the course of history. Do not doubt the small things. And a, a preposition, I guess. What marks have you been left behind? Can you solve this puzzle by retracing your steps? Is there substance to this or is it only a phantom? Synonyms, copy, unearth, vestige. Okay, so what's really sticking out here for me is this. There is evidence of it existing at some point. However, now there are only fragments of it left behind. And along with the, is there substance to this or is it only a phantom? Okay, so I wrote those down. I feel like this is like, I feel like this is, blah, blah, blah. sorry, I'm a little, woo, I'm very much enjoying the floaty energy. I feel like, I feel like this card is talking about how, um, like I talked about how I always have a root of courage and I always have. There's these parts of myself, these core parts, and I feel like I can touch the traces of them. There, there's evidence of it existing at some point. However, now there are only fragments of it left behind. I, when I think back on my life, I know, I know I was not always this way. Not that my core changed, not that my heart changed, not that my soul changed. I don't believe those things change. I don't. More that they got buried. And so I started behaving in alignment with the things that buried upon me versus being able to access and behave in alignment with who I am at my core. Because those became like, it, it's like, if, if I imagine my core as like a seed or as like, as like the earth's core, it got just buried and buried and buried. And there's only tiny little like poke holes. I know I used to be able to be this person and I know I was, and I feel the truth of it in my bones, but I don't have that same access to it. Or I didn't. And I've, and so it's like finding the trace elements of who, looking at the traces of myself and determining, is this, is there substance to this or is it only a phantom? Is this trace element true to the core of who I am or is this a phantom from anxiety, depression, mental health things, trauma. What am I sorting out there of, is this trace element I can find and point to mine? Is it me? Or is it an ingrained belief? Is it trauma? Is it, what is it? So I'm going to write about that. Okay, so I wrote, this is about finding and looking at those traces, formally identified as me, and finding out, are they my core and a hint at a deeper truth, or are they a phantom obscuring my access to my deeper self? So that's that. Let's look at the tarot. I got justice, which is fascinating because justice associates with Libra, and this is, that like, I... My moon is in Libra, so I do justice. The justice and the strength card are both strongly indicated as tied to me. The strength card is my soul card, and the justice card associates with Libra. Um, 
So either way, I'm connected to justice, whether or not it's through Libra or through my birth number eight, because in, in Thoth, um, justice and, and strength are inverted. Any hoodles. Let's see what it says for the justice card. It's not going to be much in here, so I might refer to a different guidebook that I adore. Justice, the embodiment of law, balance, and rules. She discovers truth through logic and reason and also maintains a cosmic balance between any actions. The goddess in this card takes a step back into the background while holding her sword and scale up high, symbolizing her preference for logic and balance above her own feelings. She can also represent legal issues that are about to arise. If you believe someone has wronged you, you can rest assured that the balance... Yeah, okay, so... I adore this deck, this guidebook, this guidebook, um, it's, it's not bad, it's just, it feels very standard to me, so I'm gonna pull out my Star Seeker, this is one of my favorite guidebooks literally ever, um, Justice, um, Lady Justice stands firmly atop her floating pedestal. Though she stands high in the sky, she knows she is not at risk of falling. The tools she holds are weighted evenly, and so she remains balanced and secure. Up here in the sky, there is nothing to influence her choices. Removed from society and the voice of humanity, she is able to make clear decisions from a moral high ground closer to spirit. Um... The sword in her right hand points to the sky, representing her connection to the mind and logic. In the left hand, she holds the scales, balancing logic with her emotional and spiritual connection. In all thoughts and actions, she values both the mind and heart with equal measure. As you make decisions moving forward, be sure that you are acting from this place of divine balance. Um, that is, yes. Okay, so I'm going to write, boop, boop. up here I'm going to write... Okay, so the quotes I wrote are removed from society and the voice of humanity. She's able to make clear decisions from a moral high ground closer to spirit. I also wrote, in all thoughts and actions, she values both the mind and heart with equal measure. As you make decisions moving forward, be sure that you are acting from this place of divine balance. And out of curiosity, um, this is my Tarot of the She. This is the deck I use for Mars. And I'm... I opened right to it. <laughs> I'm curious what this says. Um, Mars is my time lord. So I am the cosmic dancer of truth and balance. I am all things and their opposites. I am the heart and soul that is tempered by the logical mind. Mine is the knowing of the workings of the universe. None escape my karmic law. None are above or below me for I hold all within my scales. I am the compass point and the pole. I am the spindle and the thread. I hold the sword of the all-seeing truth. It points. It, its point sends out the rippled path into all existence. My pattern is perfect, my balance supreme. Always shifting, ever constant, I am kin with all worlds. I am the law of adjustment. All things must answer to me, and I will answer in return. The great divide of give and take finds its bridge in justice. Will you face the eye of my sword and feel its blade? Follow the spiral as it weaves from the point, and you may find the balance you seek. Um, I'm not going to write anything down from that, but that was quite powerful to read. God, I love this deck. Um, I feel like this justice card is about, for me, it's about that delicate balance. Um, remove some, for Removed from society and the voice of humanity, she is able to make clear decisions from a moral high ground closer to spirit. I feel very resonant with the justice card because I don't value logic over emotions. And I... And I don't value emotions over logic. And 
it's my moon sign that is in Libra, and the moon is water. It is the heart, and Libra is the mind, because it's air sign. So, like, it feels extra justice -y to me. Um, so I feel like, um, I feel like this is extremely direct in that I need to move forward through this period, making sure my decisions aren't, and my thoughts aren't being clouded by other people. And I, I need to very much stay grounded in what I want to give versus what people want from me. I do not have to give anyone everything they want from me. I'm in charge. I'm in charge of that. Um, I don't have to provide something because I have the skill that I could provide that thing or because I have the ability to provide that thing. So I feel like this is about staying grounded in that making sure I decide what of my creativity I want to share. Um, um, okay. So this feels like it's about deciding for myself outside of the influence of others, what of my creativity I want to share and how that unlocks further potential and drawing in of those who resonate with what I have to give to the world. Here's the thing. Um, when it comes to building your life, building my life, I am not obligated to gift myself to the whole world. I, it's not the same as gift giving with people, right? Like it would be rude for me to say to my friend, um, like if a friend told me they wanted this gift for their birthday and I get them something that's for like that I think they should want, that would be fucking rude. And yet for some of us like me, um, we get stuck in this idea of what what can we provide that other people would want instead of asking ourselves what we want to provide. What do we want to gift? Because when it's me and my life decisions, I, I absolutely am in charge of what I want to gift to people. Because it's not a... It, it's not about people because I can't, I can't make my life choices based on people in general. There's way too many of us here. I need to make my life choices based on me and, and by, by shining as the light that I am, I will draw in those people that resonate with me instead of doing it the other way around where I'm just like blasting light everywhere and because that's not sustainable for me and my life's work, while it is for, while it is in service to the world, at least I believe so for, for myself and for my work, um, while I do believe we all have a gift to give to the world, I don't believe the world gets to dictate what that gift is. I believe it's up to us to identify and figure out what it is we want to gift in service of the world, what gift we feel we have to give to the world. And from there, from there it will ripple out. There will be people who will be drawn into that, that energy. And from those people, it will ripple out further. I don't know if that makes sense. Anyways, that's the tarot card. Let's look at the Oracle. Oracle card, we have dream. I am going to put what it says at the bottom before I read the thing. Okay, so what it says at the bottom is let your mind wander, explore, and create. Imagination is boundless and abundant. And we're going to see what else it says. Bottom. 
Dreams are what comes alive in our hearts when we allow our imagination to dance with our hopes and desires. God, that is beautifully written. When we follow our dreams, we are exercising our will and autonomy and walking in the direction we have intentionally chosen to walk in. Holy damn. A lot of times we are told that our dreams are unrealistic or <laughs> silly, that what we want most is impossible or unlikely. But a dream doesn't even have to be a destination or a practical goal. You can have one dream or several dreams. They can be any size, big or small. Dreams can change, grow, and transform with you. Even if the dream is unreachable for any reason, you can still find joy in the process and journey. The most important thing is that your dreams, your dream is yours and that you have fun following them. That is st stunning. And all of these have journal and action prompts. So here's them. Uh, make a giant list of dreams. Big dreams, tiny dreams, silly dreams, old dreams, new dreams. Don't let reality hold you back. Write a letter to your present self as your future self who has actualized the dreams you have now. As your future self, what would you want your present self to know and feel? Think of some old dreams you had as a kid. Are there some that have come true? Are there some that you can make come true now? Perhaps you can learn that yo-yo trick or reach out to your favorite author or get that beanie baby you always wanted. Getting around to actualizing some old dreams can make your inner child very happy. Oh boy. There was so much in that. So I wrote, dreams are what comes alive in our hearts when we allow our imagination to dance with our hopes and desires. I also wrote, the most important thing is that your dream is yours and that you have fun following them. I, I have a lot of big feels about this card um, because one of the traces that I used to feel within myself was that I was a big dreamer and that I had a huge imagination um, and that got lost along the way. Um, and like, I still use my creativity, but there's times when it's like my creativity just dries up and no wonder if I'm not dreaming. And what I can tell you is that I feel weighed down by the programming and the fear, the belief, the fear-based belief that I can't have my dreams. I often feel like my dreams are too big and I have, I, I've always been a big dreamer and when I, like, I do not dream small and I don't mean small as a bad thing. It's just like a fact, like this is small, this is big comparatively, right? It, I mean it as the fact. Some people dream of small, tiny things, which are wonderful and, and is so fucking necessary because the world is not just made up of small. It's not just made up of big. It's both. And so we need, we need the people who dream of the small things, who look at the, the microcosmic things. And we need people who dream of the macrocosmic things and in my experience, more people seem drawn to the microcosm and not a lot of people are drawn to the macrocosm. More people dream smaller things and less people dream bigger things. And again, there's no... There's no inherent value where one is good and one is bad. They are both essential. I have always been a big dreamer. I always have dreamed of big things. I, all of my dreams were 
the dreams that were big and far-fetched, heavy air quotes, um, or not realistic, not sustainable, or like, you can't actually make money doing that. You need to have a backup job. I was told that multiple times throughout my childhood. And what are you going to do if the, when that doesn't work? You need a backup. Um... And so I put my energy into the dreams that were within my realm of reality, according to society, which was getting married and having a family. And even that dream didn't go as big as I wanted it to, um, which was a very crushing, very traumatic experience. And when I think small... When I dream small, I, I run out of stamina. I run out of, it's not, um, it's not sustainable for me. My brain doesn't think small. My brain thinks big and like big and deep. And the parts that I can identify of what took me from this thinking big. And like when I was younger, nothing could have convinced me that I wasn't going to get my dreams. Um, problem is, it eventually it gets to you. Eventually it, it gets into your subconscious when people keep saying things. Um, And then eventually, to a certain extent, you stop trying. I can't go fully back to dreaming my dreams in the public eye. I need... I need the... I need the space to dream my dreams away from humanity as a whole so I can hear and feel myself. So I can figure out for myself if those traces are me or if they are of other than me or if they're just a phantom. So dream. So I'm going to put the overall because I feel like, I feel like this has come together very clearly. Okay, so I wrote this period for the overall. This period is about taking my time and space to dream my dreams again, to dream my dreams again outside the realm of the influence of humanity and what it wishes I would be. Through this process, I can find these traces of myself and sort out what is the phantom and what is a core trace that is actually there. And then moving forward, I can build and nurture my dreams. And I've decided the thing I want to do down here at the bottom is I'm going to write a hope and dream I have for myself. But I'm not going to do that here because that wouldn't be dreaming outside of the realm of the influence of humanity. So I'm going to write that for myself. And I'm going to let future me decide whether or not I want to um, share that when we do the next reflection. Um, of November on November, like around November 1st, I will let future me handle that. That's it. Um, this was not short, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I am, I, I would love to hear if you did enjoy this type of thing. And so this is, this is my thoughts. Um, and I'm going to engage in this experiment. I don't know what quote I'm going to put here at the front. Maybe, maybe one of the dreams I'll look. 
I'm going to put this one. Dreams are what comes alive in our hearts when we allow our imagination to dance with our hopes and desires. I'm going to put that one here and then I will be all done. Anyways, I'm going to let you go here. My throat hurts, so I'm not going to do a big goodbye, but thank you for watching. I hope you had fun. I'll see you again very soon. Lots of love. Bye.